Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Brandon Taylor for Information Week. And before Forrester's Technology and Innovation Summit North America 2024 takes place in person and online in Austin, Texas, beginning September 9th through the 12th, I have the pleasure of interviewing Principal Analyst Julie Moore of Forrester, who will be a featured keynote speaker at the summit. Information Week is proud to be a media partner for this event as well. Julie will be leading a keynote presentation and an interactive Q&A in addition to a breakout session at the summit, and I get the opportunity to speak with her to preview some of those topics. So again, welcome, Julie, and thank you for taking the time to join me today. Uh, so just to set the stage a bit here for our audience, will you tell us about your role in the area of focus at Forrester? Sure. So um, I'm a principal analyst in, in that role. I do research related to IT service management, enterprise service management, knowledge management, and the service desk. So pretty much everything IT operations. Um, I've also had the opportunity to branch off and uh, do some research projects with colleagues of mine in the area of platform teams and developer experience. Um, but, you know, primarily my goal is to, to look at the market and advise Forrester clients on the best way forward, given the, the dynamics within IT operations. Thanks, Julie. And so your keynote is exploring the power of the next question. Uh, so it's no secret uh, that both AI and generative AI are completely shifting the global outlook on productivity and efficiency uh, regarding the future of work, in addition to impacting those same facets uh, of everyday life. So will you explain how the union of generative AI and knowledge management create greater innovation? Um, you know, of course, knowledge management is uh, a very popular topic for me. You know, I, I could talk about knowledge management forever. Um, but I think what excites me so much about generative AI is I, I view knowledge management as one of the, the areas that can best be advanced through the capabilities of Gen AI. It's, uh, there's some very easy use cases uh, to begin embracing within platforms where we're capturing knowledge. For example, uh, leveraging the summarization capabilities, right? Taking a, a history of an incident or an interaction with a customer and saying, hey, give me a summary of this. Um, you know, that was something that, you know, is one of the, the time uh, consuming activities of knowledge workers is looking for and consuming information. So when you can get uh, a brief summary, it allows you to understand what happens, but also engage more quickly. Um, also embedding that uh, search capability within platforms that knowledge workers are already working in limits the amount of you know jumps they're making from one platform to another or context switching. You know, so now I can be in the system of work that I do all of my work in and I can ask a question, what about this? And pose that question. And now it can go out and find the answer for me. That's a difference. Used to be we could search, but it would give us a like a whole list of responses. And then it was still up to the knowledge worker to go through that list of responses and consume that information to find the answer. And that's also, again, something that consumes a lot of time. So now I can pull out the answer and I have to be able to say, hmm, is that correct or not, right? Because we right. do recognize that we can surface information that's out of date. But when I need to confirm, I can then click on the relevant documents to go and make sure that the information is trusted. That's a big difference in a search experience. And when you're doing this, you know, five, 10 times a day, the productivity gains from a knowledge management perspective are significant for knowledge workers. Well said, Julie. And I know you mentioned uh, some of that knowledge having the potential to be um, out of date, which can be a problem, but there are also uh, several dangers or several other dangers uh, to unreliable knowledge, especially, especially when it creates avenues uh, for hallucinations to occur in generative AI systems, which uh, have also been a hot topic amongst uh, the generative AI conversation uh, at large. And risks are also heightened when AI can't be trusted. So uh, what is knowledge capacity and, and what are some of the pillars that allow it to be built? 
So I'd like to address the first part of your question because it's hallucinations. And I'm going to be honest with you. I've had colleagues that I've asked questions and I've kind of thought maybe they're hallucinating, right? <laughs> right. Knowledge, we, we, we're kind of holding AI to a standard that we don't actually have within our enterprise. Knowledge is flawed. It always will be. The, the fallacy of we need perfect knowledge is like, okay, I'm going to take away the critical thinking skills of, of my people that I keep, I'm keeping in the loop. And I'm going to say, oh, we want verified, the, the most accurate information possible. The time and effort that it takes to make sure that something is 100% accurate 100% of the time is too taxing. There is no return on investment for that. So while hallucinations can happen from invalid data being surfaced, or if we don't have the AI set up appropriately so that if it doesn't know the answer, it just says, I don't know, right? We don't want it making stuff up. Um, if that's not set up correctly, then we get into the case where we're getting hallucinations, where it, it forces us to begin untrusting the, the, the technology behind that. But the important part of that equation is keeping the human in the loop. And we absolutely need to keep knowledge workers in that critical thinking mode, right? They're not just um, taking everything and trusting the answers that they get. We've seen this across the internet. We've got fake news. We've got all the capabilities to bring information that can be false. So to think that knowledge management and generative AI is going to somehow weed through all that and give us perfect knowledge all the time, we're setting ourselves up for failure. So the critical thinking skills of our people need to be in that loop. And that's going to be a skill set that organizations are going to absolutely have to continue to further to develop. Because a lot of younger people coming into the workforce just trust what they find on the internet. And that's something that we need to reinforce. Now, as far as knowledge capacity building is concerned, you know, those organizations that have had rich sources of knowledge that they can trust to get insights from have been the ones that have been able to take early advantage in the generative AI market. It, you know, you've got data, you trust it, you can train it, an LLM on it, you can get some great value out of it. When organizations begin seeking to, to, wow, we want to jump on the bandwagon, we want to have our own LLM model, then they turn around and they look at their data and it's flawed everywhere, right? They, they haven't had rich knowledge management practices. They're capturing a ton of information, but it's not necessarily uh, you know, a, a trusted source that they can use to help support decisioning. So one of the things that you have to look at before you can begin embracing LLMs for an, your, your own internal model is where is your knowledge today and what is the state of that knowledge? And if it's not where it needs to be, you need to begin building knowledge capacity because if you're going to take advantage of this, and I highly recommend it, jump in. You need to begin experimenting. This is not one of those waves that you want to be the last organization to get into you know, you you want to have the, the value add from that, but there's a critical weakness if you don't have quality knowledge to use as part of that exploration. Modern enterprises have uh, adapted to changes in their operational needs by utilizing emerging technology seemingly at the speed of sound, though gaps in the skills required haven't necessarily closed at the same pace. So what are some of the ways that uh, traditional and siloed perspectives on gatekeeping uh, this knowledge can stifle agile knowledge management? Yeah, so the, the skills element is another important thing. Um, mm -hmm. if, if an organization has done and has invested in skills development over time, then they're going to have staff that are ready to begin taking advantage of some of the new capabilities that, that can help accelerate you know, knowledge management um, and in particular, agile knowledge management. Generative AI is one of those accelerators, the ability to generate summaries and even generate content. This is the first time in my lifetime, and I've been a knowledge management practitioner forever, You know, being able to use a tool to say, hey, create a knowledge article from that, this is new. Um, and so having the skill sets, the, the, the knowledge and the understanding of how to engineer a prompt, how to take um, our templates, our governance models, and embed them into the way that we're managing knowledge by leveraging the technologies to help us manage some of that 
You know, those are skill sets that we, if we'd been preparing and we had an AI practice and, you know, we had a really strong AI strategy before Gen AI came out, we're, we would have the skills that we need to make the, the right decisions. Um, but organizations, you know, they're kind of caught a little bit behind and, you know, generative AI skill sets are not something that you can easily recruit for right now. You know, people, right. they'll say they're an expert, but, you know, it's been around for a hot minute. So um, it's something that we're naturally going to have to build internal um, to our organizations. And even if you can find resources externally, they're going to be expensive. So knowledge capacity building, which we talked about in the, the, the previous question, is not just about building knowledge. It's also about building your your capacity, your future capacity to create new and rich experiences that can be shared. And that means giving people the opportunity to experiment to try new things, to learn new th new things and bring that knowledge into the enterprise so that that can continue to perpetuate the learning that occurs. The more that that information flo flows, the more that everyone is learning from each other. And so if you want an agile practice, you're gonna have to have knowledge that's exchanged real time and knowledge that's not easily documented, which we call explicit. That's the stuff that you'll see in documents and things today in organizations. It's that tacit information, the stuff that you're learning every day as you go through your job. Those are the aha moments that we should be sharing more of across our enterprise, but it's often difficult to do. Well said. And so uh, let's shift gears a bit and touch on uh, the breakout session uh, that you'll be leading at the summit regarding navigating the new terrain of platform teams and operations. Will you explain product centricity and why platform teams are having a major impact on the modern mindset and approach to technology management? Sure. Um, IT operations has always been in this precarious place where ever since the dot com dot dot com bubble, we have had problems with funding where it seems like the, the work goes up and our funding model goes down. And so the, the, you know, we're always doing more with less and we have fewer resources and we have a lot of hero mentality and we seem to just get the work done. Um, but at some point, right, we, we need to look at the way that we operate and say, is this the best way for IT, uh, IT organizations to operate. We've had longstanding principles and guidelines coming from IT service management that have kind of said, this is how we should operate. And yet we see that there's kind of a gap between what's expected of us in the organization, what the business is willing to fund and you know where we're actually delivering. So when you look at very important services that IT operations is delivering to the business, running it like a product can be very advantageous. So you're, you're saying that, okay, this product, we call it service in IT, but this product is so important to the business that we want to make sure that it's delivering on expectations. So we form a team, a platform team, that will be very product centric, customer outcome oriented. They'll be value stream oriented, looking for delay gates. You know, where, where in the service delivery process are, do we have delay gates? How can we eliminate these things? Right. They're gonna look for ways to automate as it relates to the service delivery. And they'll have the people and the skill sets that are necessary to actually build that automation, right? Because the team will be very much a cross-functional team. So the idea of a platform team is quite interesting to organizations because they are searching for that new operating model that can really help to support agility, responsiveness. Um, we, we've kind of struggled that. We get a lot of grief from developers that, you know, operations is too slow, change management takes forever. And so this is kind of a way for us to begin approaching what we do in operations much more holistically, very much focused on the outcomes that we want to drive for the business. So you've gone over a lot of the benefits of, uh, of, of having a platform team and, and utilizing uh, the, that approach and mindset to IT operations, but, but having a leader is really important as well. And so why is a designated IT platform manager such an integral part of this organizational shift? 
Yeah. So the first of all, the whole team, the whole platform team really needs to have product management training, right? This is not something where you just take an existing IT team and you go, oh, you're now a product team, which sh- Shazam, right? <laughs> they need the skill sets to understand what it means to actually run that service like a, a product, which would make them a platform team. So when you look at the IT platform manager, they're going to be guiding that. That's kind of a new skill set within the organization, bringing in the product management capabilities, but the knowledge and understanding of IT operations and engineering and design. So we want someone that can talk to all of these different groups, that can advocate for what's important for the business. And so that IT platform manager is a really important part of the success of bringing these, you know, cross domain t- uh, teams together because there's very different cultures. There's different perspectives, right? There's different operating models that have existed for decades. And so you need someone that can be that unifying bridge between them. Now, one of the cautionary tales with the platform manager is that often Uh, organizations have said, okay, we've got a platform manager. Not only are they going to take on design and delivery and engineering, we also want them to do the people management as well. The last thing that you want to do with a platform team is dilute their purpose. And the manager's role, which is to ensure success of that platform team, that's what they need to be microly focused on. So We have a tendency in IT operations to just keep adding stuff onto people's plate to the point where they don't have the capacity to focus on what's really important. They end up doing the firefighting and then the the long term strategy stuff just kind of falls to the wayside. So with a platform team and the manager, we want them to be microly focused on the outcomes, you know, the value uh, driving the value for the business. And that means being dedicated to, to making that happen. What do organizations need to consider when making the transition to platform teams? I think one of the most important things is look at what you're measuring. Uh, IT operations have had you know, very uh, long-standing metrics uh, that have defined operational health, um, you know, things like uh, availability of services, um, average handle time for the service desk, right? We have these metrics that we've always thought about as being a way to manage operations. But when you start thinking about a value stream and you start thinking about the the outcomes that you're delivering to the business, you really need to look at establishing OKRs, right? Things that are looked at, what are those objectives and how are we going to achieve that? And are we progressing towards those objectives? Um, Like I said before, the culture is an important part of it. We have very different languages, different nomenclature, uh, you know, different culture between the teams. So you're going to have to focus on that. But one of the biggest danger points, and we have seen some research coming back from our clients, is not to, to do what's called platform whitewashing. In other words, don't just take your team and say, okay, now you're a platform team and I want you to manage the service like a product. Um, That's a recipe for failure. You need to set the team up for success, which means, like I said before, getting them the training they need to understand what it means to manage a service like a product, have the organization understand their role, what they're doing and the the outcomes that they, they need to achieve. And then set them up for success, you know, that, you know, ad, advocating for the mission of, of why you're creating this and, and giving the time and the resources and the funding to make it happen. Because we run IT as a cost center. When you want, when a business rides on that platform and if it goes down, the business stops, that's not something you want to give funding, you know, every once in a while to. That's something that you want funding that's persistent, something that's always going to be there that you know you're investing in a core uh, product that runs your organization. So there's a lot of differences between the way that we run IT and what we do under platforms. Um, and it's an important part of bridging the gap between the two is, is making sure you're focused on the right things. Thanks, Julie. Um, and, and you've obviously got uh, some really good and informative uh, presentations coming up uh, to expect and, and dive into more uh, at the summit. And so outside of the sessions that you'll be 
uh, presenting um, come September, uh, the week of September the 9th. Uh, what is one can't miss session at the Technology and Innovation North America Summit that you're most excited about? Oh, now you've put me on the spot. I have to pick favorites. <laughs> Um, I, I, my, one of my very good friends, Carlos Casanova has got one of the closing keynotes on AI ops. And, uh, you know, I look at what's happening in the, the, the movement of what's happening within AI ops as we begin embracing stuff like generative AI, but also how that is now bridging into operations instead of being a separate entity, it's, we, we recognize the value of having, all of that real-time monitoring data as part of uh, diagnosing and, and restoring services. So um, that's a session I'm not going to miss. A great friend of mine and uh, highly entertaining. Um, can't wait to see it myself. Awesome. Thanks, Julie. And, and for our audience, make sure you take note uh, of that. And, and that'll be a session that you won't want to miss, uh, including the sessions that uh, we've touched on that Julie will be leading as well. Uh, and so I appreciate your expertise and participation in this interview today. Uh, and thank you to our audience as well uh, for tuning into this uh, informative interview. If you haven't already, make sure to register for Forrester's Technology and Innovation Summit North America 2024. Again, taking place in person and online in Austin, Texas, beginning September the 9th through the 12th. And again, Information Week is a media partner for this event and will be providing exclusive coverage. Uh, but again, to my interviewee, uh, Julie Moore, thank you for your time today and have a great day. Thanks for having me.